you're able to, and join me in the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord with your whole heart. On the day I call to you, you answer me. God's steadfast love endures forever. Thanks be to God. Our opening hymn is O Beautiful for Spacious Skies, hymn 564. to return to the Lord. Gracious God, have mercy on us, for we have failed to be faithful to you, though you have been faithful to us. You show us your wisdom, but we prefer to go our own way. Our broken relationships with you and one another have created poverty in us and our neighbors. In your mercy, reconcile us to you and one another for the work of justice, peace, and love. Now take time for your own private personal prayer confession.
Amen. Okay. Sisters and brothers, do not lose heart. When we call, God hears us. When we confess, God forgives us. We believe and so we proclaim. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Ushers, please come forward to receive the offering.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for these tithes and offerings. We thank you for the gift that they have been given in love. And we thank you for the opportunity that they will have to do your work in this world. And we pray, God, that each of us would be faithful disciples to you, seeking to love our community, to pray for our community, and to be your hands and feet in Chula Vista and beyond. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is a hymn of preparation, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. Hymn number 562. <laughs> If you wish to fo uh, follow, you can follow on page 377 in your pew Bible. Let us hear the word. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind, and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful to me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Now verse 13. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Wonderful are your works that I may know very well, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them, and they are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. This is the word of the Lord. Before I get started on my sermon today, I do want to acknowledge that today is, well, tomorrow is Memorial Day. It is a day when we remember those who have risked their lives for our sake. Jesus said this, I preached on this a couple weeks ago, greater love has no one than this, that they would lay down their life for a friend. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take some time in prayer. And in that time of prayer, there's going to be a time of silence. And I invite you to share the names of those you know who lost their life in the service of others. You can name it out loud, you can name it in your heart, but I think the naming is important because it is in the remembering that we acknowledge what we have been taught by their sacrifice. And so let us pray. God, on this day, when we celebrate fallen heroes, people who listened to the call and signed up, people who willingly risked their lives so that we might have freedom and others might have freedom as well, We thank you. We thank you for the gift of them in our lives and for the gift that they shared of your love in the sacrifice that they made. And so God, we pray to you this morning and we lift up to you these names as a hymn of praise for the lives that have been lost. And so we lift up those names to you right now.
Thank you. Thank you, God, for the gift of these people, their presence in our lives, and their presence in their sacrifice. And we thank you that their lives were not lived in vain, that they were lived with a willingness to serve others. May they be a witness to all of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. I apologize. I'm going to abruptly switch gears and tell a joke. So I'm just letting you know that. I'm apologizing now. So, today we're talking about hearing God's word. So I'm going to tell you some funny ways that kids heard the Lord's prayer wrong. Our Father, who art in heaven, Harold is his name. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from email. And then a, a kid was asked, in Sunday school, they were coming into church to celebrate communion together. They were talking about communion, and they came into worship. But before they went into worship, their Sunday school teacher said they had to be quiet in church. And so the Sunday school teacher asked them, why do you think we need to be quiet in church? Now, she thought they were going to say, so that we can hear the voice of God. But the child said, so we don't wake anyone up just in case they're sleeping. (laughs) No. This week, we are beginning a six-week series on the book of 1st and 2nd Samuel, and we're going to be talking about, today, about hearing the voice of God, which is why I thought I'd share some stories about hearing the voice of God, maybe incorrectly. Um, (laughs) I'm sure you're never going to pray the Lord's Prayer again without saying, and deliver us from email, Um, but... As we enter this six-week series, we're going to be starting in the third chapter of 1 Samuel. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who Samuel was. So, Samuel was the promised child of a family who dealt with infertility. So, here's what happened. His mother, Hannah, longed for a child longed desperately for a child. And every year, they would go to the temple, and her husband would make a sacrifice for their children, not Hannah's children, but his other wife's children, and the other wife would mock Hannah for not being a mom and say, well, God must not love you, and your husband must not love you because... Look at all the kids I have with him. Aren't I so wonderful and special? And every year, Hannah's husband would say, but you're my favorite. I love you so much. And he would give her more than his wife who had all the kids. But she still desperately wanted a child, a child that was not coming And so one day, as they were there to make their yearly sacrifice, she went into the temple and began to pray. But as she began to pray, she was feverishly moving her lips, but no sound was coming out. And Eli, the priest in the temple, said, walked up to her and said, "Um, excuse me, are you drunk? Because no one normally prayed like that, but she was so desperate to have a child that she went in and was desperately crying out to God for a child. And so Eli prophesied that she would have a child. And so Hannah promised that this child would be dedicated 
at the temple and would live at the temple once he was weaned, that he would live at the temple. And so Eli raised Samuel, and he raised him to be a priest and eventually a prophet. And this is where we meet Samuel and Eli. Samuel and Eli are living at the temple. They are doing all of the temple rites. Samuel is being taught by Eli. But there's something that we're going to read in the text towards the end that I want to explain before we read it. And that is that Eli, although he is lifted up now as the, as the high priest, is going to, his family will be written off. Now, what is the reason for this? Typically, the, the children of the high priest, they would be that ne- in line to be the next high priest. Only Eli's family, Eli's sons, have been despicable in the sight of the Lord. And so what has happened is that Eli's family is going to be written off. And so here is where we hear that prophecy, but we also hear where Samuel first hears God's voice. So we look in 1 Samuel, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering under, to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim that he could not see, was lying down in his room, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying in the temple where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am. And ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Samuel said, but Eli said, I did not call you, lay down again. So he went to lay down, and the Lord again called, and he said, Samuel. So Samuel got up, and he went to Eli, and said, here I am, you call me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the, Lord, the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you call me. And then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. And on that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming against God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall be expiated, shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the door to the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, He said, here I am, Eli said. What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. 
May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his word fall to the ground. And all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. So I, before I left, I shared with you that I was going to go to my 20th uh, seminary reunion. And when the reunion was all over and most people had left, there was just uh, the four of us girls and ladies. We're not girls anymore. <laughs> We're in our 40s. Uh, the four of us ladies and um, our friend Eric. And we had dinner with him that night. And most of them had not spent any time with him. He lives in California, so I've seen him a number of times. And he, he and his family have this fancy beach house in um, San Malo and Oceanside. So we hang out there sometimes. <laughs> we as a family hang out there sometimes with his family. So I know what has happened in Eric's life, but my friends weren't really sure. So my friend Jenny said, tell me more about your journey and how you ended up in California, because this guy's from Colorado, so how did you end up in California? And he said, well, when I first graduated from seminary, I was told by the CPM. Now, the Presbyterian Church likes to have lots of committees that have lots of acronyms. So the CPM is the Committee on Preparation for Ministry. It is the group that you have to meet with when you want to get ordained. They ask you lots of questions, they make you take tests, they make you go to seminary and take language, dead languages. They basically tell you whether or not God is calling you to be a pastor. And when he graduated, he was told that if, if he took a church, that he would kill it. So he was 24 years old. What do you, what do you expect? We all, we all lovely, lovingly killed churches. But he was told, like, so you need to do kind of an internship year. And as we were sitting there at Tiger Noodle, our favorite Asian restaurant, um, we were sitting there, and I was thinking, the audacity of all of us that at 24, 25, we were all 22 when we started seminary, the audacity that God would have this big, giant call for our lives. Oh, the youth. But it, it made me think that it doesn't matter what age that we are, that God has a call for our lives. Now, in the church, we sometimes, talk, when we talk about call, we talk about it as being people are called to be pastors or missionaries. But in the Reformed understanding of our faith, vocation is not just about being a pastor or an elder or a leader in the church. Vocation is about that thing that God is calling us to, whether it be our actual professional vocation or volunteer work that we do or something or being a parent or being a foster parent or being in someone's life, it is the thing that we are called to do. And I remember the first time that I realized that call was not just about being called to be a pastor or a missionary, and this was when I was in seminary, and I remember my mom had been really struggling with her job. She, my mom was a special education teacher for many years, but she just had always longed to be a singer. 
Now, if you know me, my sisters, they're professional musicians. They, one of them is a tenured singer in the tenured chorus member of the, uh, the San Francisco Opera. My other sister sang musical theater for many years. My, I mean, my family are singers, but my mom had wanted so desperately for that to be her life call as well. She majored in music. But her parents told her that if she wanted to have a job, there were two options, to be a nurse or to be a teacher. She graduated from college in 1972. It makes sense in like the middle of Cal in the, like the rural part of California. It all makes sense. And so my mom always felt like she missed her calling. We heard it a lot growing up. She felt like she had missed her calling. But my mom was a fabulous teacher. I used to sit in her class. She taught like little babies, like first through third graders that were uh, in special education class and special day classes. And she was a wonderful teacher. And so Again, the audacity of my youth. I remember writing a letter to my mom about vocation and how I know, mom, that you've always been disappointed with this thing, that you never got to be a famous performer, but you are doing what God has called you to do by being a special education teacher. And my mom still has that letter. She kept it because she realized that sometimes we think we have a calling, we think we have this thing that we're supposed to do, but it turns out that God might be calling us to do something else. And God was calling Samuel for something very specific, a very specific, hard and difficult task. See, Samuel was really the last judge, so the people who ruled over Israel before the kings were the judges. And he was the first prophet. And the first thing that God called him to prophesy was that his mentor, the man who had been raising him, that his family would be cut off. I mean, what a task. This kid, I mean, Samuel, we don't know his exact age, but it was some time between the age of his weaning, which was two when Hannah brought him to the temple, and when he would have had his equivalent of his bar mitzvah. So he was probably somewhere between the age of eight and 12 that God called out to him and said, Samuel, Samuel, Listen to me and bring this word to the people. Now, I think that God called Samuel because he was young. Because he hadn't gotten so jaded, because life hadn't stepped in for him to say, oh, that can't be God. It must be something else. But I think as we age, God is still continuing to call us. God is still continuing to ask us to listen to his voice for what he is calling us to do. Because until the moment we take our last breath, our life is in God. And so we still continue to have a call and a mission from God to do his will and his work. And so how in the world do we discern that? Because this passage is about Samuel learning to hear the voice of God. So how do we continue to learn to hear the voice of God in our own midst? And a really great way that I have learned, and actually Cynthia Tate is the, is the person who pointed out this gentleman to me. His name is Graham Standish. 
and he is a Presbyterian pastor and spiritual director, and he has this little three-fold pamphlet about how to discern God's will in our lives. So I'm going to read to you his little pamphlet. I'm not going to read the whole pamphlet. The pamphlet's long, but I'm going to read to you how we can hear the voice of God. Number one, he says, and I think this is incredibly important, that we are supposed to be regular readers of Scripture. How do you get to know the voice of someone or how they speak? It is by listening to their voice. And the best way to get to know God's voice is to listen to his voice through Scripture. And then he describes a way in which we can sit and discern the voice of God. He says this, to take time to center ourselves, a quiet time to center ourselves. Don't like do it while you're making dinner or while you're um, you know, bustling about. He says, take time to sit with God. Then ask God in prayer for what God wants you to discern. Then he says, to listen. But when he says to listen, he says ignore the first voice. Because the first voice is probably what you want. The first voice is probably what you think is supposed to happen, what is the good and righteous and wonderful answer. This is the reason he says to ignore the first voice. Then he says to listen even more deeply, to sit and to listen more deeply and to ignore the second voice. Because that second voice may be fear or anxiety or hope, our own hopes, or logic or appeasing others. And he, but he says to listen intently and to pay attention to the deepest, most peaceful sense of what is right. And then he says to, if you hear the voice of God and you're trying to discern something, he said, don't discern it in a vacuum, but take it to others. People that you know and respect and hear the voice of God and to discern it with others. So what we're going to do is we are going to take the opportunity to give to God today something that you might be discerning. You can fill in the blank because I'm sure you, that thing came right to your head of what you might be discerning this day. And to take some time in prayer to listen to God's voice and to listen for what God might be telling you to do. So let's go before God in prayer. God, we thank you that you speak to us. We thank you that you live in our lives this and every day. And we thank you for examples like young Eli. You said, here I am, your servant. I'm listening. And so, God, we ask that you would help us to listen this morning. And so we lift to you the thing that we are discerning and desiring to hear your voice on this morning. And we lift it to you. We thank you for the voice of discernment that you are bringing to this situation. We thank you for the witness of your love that is surrounding it. And we pray for continued open ears to listen.
take away in us anything that might be fear or anxiety or rushing into things. Anything that might not be from you. We pray for your clarity and your wisdom. We pray, God, that you would continue to speak to us and that we would continue to have open ears to listen for whatever you are calling us to do. And we pray that you would continue to teach us what it means to be your followers, just as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us stand and sing our closing hymn, God be with you till we meet again. Thank you. Now go in the grace, peace, and love of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.